to really consider that, okay? This verse does not put the pressure on the pastor. As we see a count, it's not, the, it's not uh, Jesus Christ reaming out the pastor for how he was your pastor. It is the fact that the pastor will give a report of his flock to Jesus Christ of how they live their spiritual lives. He will give it a, a report on your life. The result will either be, as the scripture says, profitable or unprofitable for you, that account. You say, well, that makes the pastor a tatter, tattletale. Well, I guess it does. But we will give account to Jesus Christ. The under-shepherd will have a part at the judgment seat of Christ concerning your rewards and give a report of what kind of Christian you were, whether you were tender and responding and faithful and godly or cantankerous and hard to leave and lead and unfaithful and unwilling and calloused and bullheaded. I wanted to say that. <laughs> it's really going to happen. It's really here in the Word of God in black and white. Remember your spiritual overseers, their words, their faith, their lives, and the end of their faith. It really matters. Be focused on your life, that God has given someone to help you, to be helpers of your joy, to be helpers of your spiritual life, to help direct, to help guide. And here, the two words, to rule and to obey. Strong words, I understand. But there's a second point in this sermon. I'm so glad to be done with the first one. And that is a much greater point, a much wonderful point. The idea of remembering pastors or spiritual overseers, it counts infinitely more to remember in verse number 8 that we need to keep focused on Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 8. It says, Jesus Christ, which, let's all read it together, please. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. This is a tremendous verse. It's a, a verse of consolation, as you'll see in just a moment. Couch between an exhortation to, rem to remember faithful men, pastors, and an exhortation in the next verse to avoid heretical doctrines of men is the admonition to focus on the unchanging God-man. It's a good thing in every account in a believer's life to focus on Jesus Christ. He is the captain of your faith. He is the author of your faith. He started, he walked your faith. He's been there before. He knows what opposition's like. He walked on this earth. He had great opposition, uh, great contradiction of sinners against himself. He's been there. He's done that. Look at him. He's consistent. He was consistent, is consistent. This verse almost seems like a misplaced proverb from the book of Proverbs. It doesn't seem to have connection as you read it through. It's just all of a sudden, it's like that there's a little uh, glitch, and he just throws out verse number 8 in the middle of the context and just says about Jesus Christ. Though it may seem a little misplaced, I think the connection in this context is, is this. Men, we talked about pastors, We'll talk about heretical doctrine of people, of men, of teachers in the next verse. Men are not dependable, but Jesus is. We are to follow the faith of men in verse number 7, but to understand that men can fail you and will fail you. Jesus Christ is the infinite, dependable rock that you can always look to, you can always stand upon, you can always count on, you always, always can trust on to be truthful. He is what men can never be. He is what I can never be as your pastor. He is the rock. He is the same. He is infinitely right and righteous, Jesus Christ. It is great to follow the faith of godly men, verse 7, but men will fail you. Even the most godly of men sometimes will disappoint you and let you down. And that's been true of my case also. Many of you know that my youth pastor ran away with a girl in my youth group. It was a crushing blow on my church. Men will fail you. We all know great men that have fallen in their lives. Some of them are faithful to God for many, many years, and in their 70s or 60s or 70s, they, they fall in finances or, mor or morality or whatever. Great preachers all that time. Men disappoint you. Never set your heart on men. Set your heart on Jesus Christ. Never let the fall of a pastor change your faith in Christ. He is a man. Focus on faithful Christ. Now, that's great religious preaching, but what does that have to do with the application of my Monday morning, tomorrow. What does it have to do with my life? It has everything to do with your life. Follow with me, please. The truth here is that Jesus Christ is always the same, and it's true in many aspects. It is what we can depend on doctrinally and theologically for many of the ways that we live our life. Consider, first of all, that Jesus is obviously more than a man. Look at the verse again. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. This is obviously a deity statement. He is God. No man can ever say that he's the same yesterday and today and forever. This is not a statement about a guy who's in a rut who does the same things over and over and over. This is a statement about deity, of who he is. 
This is saying, I never change, I never did change, I never will change. I am the same, I am Jesus Christ. I'm infinitely greater than any man. It's a God statement. Consider yesterday. Hear the word of God. In the beginning was the word. This is Jesus. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Jesus Christ was there infinitely yesterday in time past. Jesus was part of the Godhead before anything else ever existed. Some would like to create Jesus Christ that moment in Bethlehem. No, no, no. The Lord Jesus Christ was always God. Philippians 2 says about Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Before Jesus Christ came down to this earth, it was not a thing that he grasped hold of. It was no big deal that he was equal with God. He willingly chose to, for a moment in physical form, to set that equality or that position being in the form of God aside come out of the pearly gates out of the ivory palaces and come and hobnob with men but understand forever in the past Jesus Christ was God the scripture says in Hebrews 1 3 who being in the brightness of God's glory his glory this is talking about Jesus and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. You see, why is this important that Jesus Christ was the express image of God's person? I've heard that forever. Because Satan would love to attack the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. If it was not the God that died on the cross for you, you have no redemption. Man's blood could never save man. It had to be the blood of the Lord God. It had to be Jesus Christ in his position of the Godhead that died on the cross for our sins. It's no great thing that man should die for man. Today and this week, we'll remember many men who fell on a battlefield for other people back home. Listen, it is a great thing, however, when the Lord God of all creation, Almighty God himself, second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, comes to earth and dies on the cross at the hands of men. When God dies for man, that produces salvation. That's what's great. Jesus Christ is always the same. He is always God, yesterday, past. In eternity past yesterday, Jesus was God. And that, that certainty goes on for today. Romans chapter 8, verse 34 says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again. Listen to this. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Where is Jesus now? He's on his Father's throne. Why? Because he is God. He is presently there. Today, the verse said in Romans 8, 34, he is making intercession for all those who have trusted upon him. What does it mean to intercede? It means to have somebody who goes to bat with, for you. I don't know about you, but there are very few people in this world that you can find who will intercede for you, who will really go to bat for you, who will take of their time, who will take of their, of their resources, who will take of everything they are and set them aside and, and intercede or go to bat for you. It takes such great servanthood for someone to intercede. Listen, Jesus is the dependable interceder. He will always be there interceding for sinful men. He is the same. He is the perfect interceder by his blood. To intercede means to bridge a gap between two people. To go to bat for somebody else. All right? A pinch hitter or whatever those are called. Designated hitter. Not a big... Baseball guy, I tried. All right? Hey, now listen to me. The Lord Jesus Christ was that interceder for you on the cross that bridged the gap between you and God. Now, I want to explain this because it is a precious thought to Christians and the unsaved. Don't you turn me off because you're already saved. This is a great thought. There's a great gulf fixed between God and man, a great gulf. Man in his sinfulness cannot approach Almighty God. We have determined it. It was certainly that it was in our, our genes. We, are, we have sin natures, but yet we determined in our own right to sin against God. There's nobody that told the five-year-old, the six-year-old to sin against God. He does it because he wants to. Okay, now listen to me. That great gulf between God and, uh, God and man is a great gulf that no one can ever span. There are no good works that create a bridge long enough to get to God that can be right with God. There's nothing that I can do as far as religious religion is concerned or good works is concerned or any morality that I can muster in order to bridge that great gap 
that is, that is spreading between me and God. I cannot come to him in any way. No prayer can reach across that gap. It is so far that any prayer uttered without 